Always good to know. Um, we are, as I say, starting a series today, and I'm looking at the first two statements that Jesus made as uh, as the. I was worried when you start talking, all the tech people start running around. Um, the first two phrases that Jesus uses on the cross. Um, it's interesting that we we arranged this series weeks ago. Um, we talked about having this series of lead up to Easter to prepare our hearts for what actually you know Easter really means to us this year. A long time before all that we hear was about war, and a war that we've just prayed about, a war that we don't understand, a war that people are getting really cross and stressed about, understandably. Sometimes we think it's unforgivable because we can't take it back, we can't change it, we can't... And then there was light. (laughs) Um, But God, uh, Jesus in his first statement on the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. And I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about that statement today. That sense of, actually, with what Jesus was going through, he still was calling for them to be forgiven. And sometimes, as I say, we think it's unforgivable because you can't take it back. How do we forgive the unforgivable? We know sometimes people just hurt each other without thought, without any pre-planning, without caring. They just have a heart to hurt others. How do you forgive when by definition what has happened to you is unforgivable? And so this morning I just want to think about forgiveness from three different angles really. The sense of us forgiving others, the sense of God forgiving us, and the sense of of ourselves choosing to forgive ourselves. But let's just set the text to start with. Setting setting the text, setting the context of, of what we're talking about. We all know the story. The story is not a new one. It's a story um, probably since before we were Christians that we knew about. It's probably the most famous story in the whole of the Bible. But let's just go through it again, just to set the scene for the coming weeks leading us up to Easter. It's Friday morning, 9am, and it's time. Just outside the Damascus Gate is that road, that road that leads to a hill. Up above is a rocky ledge that if you look at from a certain angle, looks like a skull. You can see that it's eroded into the limestone, two sockets that look like eyes. A place where the nose would have been and maybe even a place for a jaw or a mouth. Skull Hill, they called it. Golgotha. It was the place where the Romans held crucifixion. And Friday was the day and nine o'clock was the time when this happened. The soldiers were ready. As we know, they were Roman soldiers. They were from a different part of the world. They weren't from Palestine. They weren't from Israel. They weren't followers of the law. They were simply soldiers who had a job to do. They were following the rules of their job. They were in charge of crucifixions. They were the executioners. So it's nine o'clock on Friday, and up the road comes a group of people. The soldiers know that the two of the men being crucified were just average, ordinary, everyday criminals. This is what they do. It's part of their routine. But the third man, a prophet from Nazareth, Nazareth, his case is different. They know he's different because of the trials last night. They know this is different because of the buzz of the crowd. There is a man carrying his cross because he is too weak to carry his own. That man is called Simon. This man, Jesus, is barely walking at all. Sometimes he's crawling, each step with agony. He clearly had been beaten with an inch of his life, beaten and bruised. On his head, a crown of thorns. The Roman soldiers laid the cross out on the ground and they laid the body of Jesus on that cross. They wrapped rope around his arm and around his ankles. They drove spikes into his forearms and into his feet. And with the ropes in place, they began to pull the cross up. They dropped it and it fell with a thud. And there was Jesus, beaten, bruised 
and bloody. It was only a matter of time before he gave up the ghost. The soldiers stood back, satisfied. A job well done. But what do they hear? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What the soldiers did that day was unforgivable. That's what the definition is. When you crucify someone, especially Jesus, God in flesh, surely that's beyond forgiveness. And yet Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This was an unforgivable sin. But Jesus wanted them forgiven. I just want to make a couple of points about forgiveness this morning. And I suppose in the context of what we're seeing in the world, it's, it's kind of important to consider as Christians and as human beings. The first one, is it possible to forgive the unforgivable? We've just heard probably the most unforgivable thing that happened on this earth. But actually, if you listen to the news, there is much sadness, much horror happening around the world. Not just in the war that we know of, but all around the world. And the amount of times we hear this phrase, it's unforgivable. But actually, can you forgive the unforgivable? We hear phrases like, they knew exactly what they were doing. They knew what they were doing before they were doing it. They knew they were going to hurt me and they went and did it anyway. When she told that lie, she knew what she was doing. When he double-crossed me, he knew what he was doing. And on and on and on. They knew they would hurt me and they did it on purpose. But as Christians, we need to consider Jesus' response. Who was he talking about when he said, for they know not what they are doing? Who is the they he was talking about? Was it the Roman soldiers in front of him that had put him on the cross? They knew what they were doing. They were just following orders. It was their job. Did they know who he was? Probably not really. They'd probably heard the rumours and has been aware of what had happened the day before. But if anybody really didn't know what they were doing, it may have been the soldiers. It was just their job. What about Pilate? Did Pilate know what he was doing? We knew Pilate knew the situation. We knew that Pilate knew Jesus had been called the king of the Jews and we know it scared him to death we know he wanted to wash his hands of the situation didn't he he wanted to be away with it he didn't want it to be his decision to make he clearly didn't want to get involved what about Caiaphas he, uh, Caiaphas knew that Jesus was called the son of God the Messiah what did Caiaphas do I want nothing to do with this. Crucify him and get him out of here. Again, somebody that's not knowing the whole situation and doesn't want to be involved. What about Judas? Surely Judas, if everybody knew what was going on, Judas had spent three and a half years with Jesus. But as you can probably tell by reading the New Testament, Judas was totally confused about what was going on about really who Jesus was. Even though he'd spent all that time with him, Judas seemed to still be totally confused. Judas thought Jesus was going to roll into Jerusalem and take over as the king, and was baffled when Jesus kind of went in as a servant. One of the reasons I believe he betrayed Jesus was because he was confused, he was disillusioned, he was disappointed from what he expected this magnificent entry into Jerusalem to be. And I'm not saying they're not guilty. Judas was guilty. Pilate was guilty. Caiaphas was guilty. And on and on. The Roman soldiers were guilty. The Jewish leaders, the Pharisees, the scribes, the mob, the spectators who cheered and laughed as it happened. Everyone was guilty. And yet Jesus looked down and said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they are doing. What seems to be the important phrase. They don't know what 
they are doing. They knew what they were physically doing, but they did not know what it really meant. They knew what they were doing, but they didn't know really who they were doing it to and what it would mean for then and for the future. And I think sometimes that can be the way of all sin. We don't always take on how serious it is as individuals and as collective. But we serve a God who has made that sacrifice, who has shed blood on that cross, who has died so that we may be forgiven. And he still, at that point, spoke to his father and said, forgive them, because they don't truly know what they're doing. My second thought, is it possible to forgive the unforgivable by remembering that Jesus forgave us? Sometimes it's hard to forgive things that we feel are so big. And it doesn't matter how many times we hear that sin is the same, whether it's this big or this big. We still sometimes like to grade it, don't we? I can forgive that person that put rubbish in my bin, but I can't forgive that person that did that. But God sees it all the same. And the reason he forgave us, the reason he probably you know, would still say forgive them because they don't know what they're doing today is so that we can forgive others. So that we have that sense of being forgiven and that, that release that it brings in order that we can forgive others. Um, I know a lady, I've known her for about 20 odd years and work, she lives down in London and uh, one day we were in communication she said, oh, I've been called for jury duty. And it was like the big, biggest court you could go to. You know, she was there, she was on jury duty. And it turned out to be quite a famous case where um, somebody had been killed by somebody else. And she said, I'm not going to say any more than that other than the fact that she, uh, while she was on jury duty, she was obviously listening to everything that was going on, but was transfixed by the mother of the person who'd been killed. To the point that at the end of it all, when it all happened and all gone and everything was over, she managed to find out where this person lived and wrote to her and just said, I probably shouldn't do this. Um, I'm not going to talk about what happened. I just want to say that you're an inspiration and that you, the way you've behaved, the way you acted in, in court, the things you said, the, just blew me away. And this lady wrote back and said, well, I had to forgive him because I couldn't change the situation. I couldn't make my loved one come back. I couldn't make it any better. But the bitterness I held in me for the unforgiveness in them was ruining my life. It was killing me and it was killing those around me. So I chose to forgive and that's an amazing example to us, isn't it? That in, even in grief, even in pain, even in awful situations, we as Christians can remember what Jesus did for us. And it's that example of what we then can offer to others. It's not easy. I'm not promising it's easy. But that release that we feel when we no longer hold on to it. I thought about bringing all my, the kids' bags with me today. You know, I send my children off to school. I'm sure we've all done it. You know, Remy on the day she goes, she's got PE and she's got pat lunch and she's got, she looks like she's going on a Tibetan hike or something. And you can see she's slowly getting lower as the bags go on. And I believe that can be us if we, if we keep hold of that, that we don't forgive. We need to forgive. Third point, we can seek forgiveness from God. We've heard that. We know we've got it wrong. We know others have got it wrong. We can't hide behind somebody we think is sinning worse than us. We need to seek forgiveness. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned, and all come short of the glory of God. Some will say, well, if everybody sins, what's the point of worrying about it? But God says, come to me. Hand me those burdens. Hand me those things you've got wrong. 
and I will give you release. We can't just say it. I'm, I'm again talking about children. I'm not mentioning mine because they might be on Zoom. But we've all had it when we've had little children. When you go, say sorry. And they'll do everything but actually say the word sorry. They'll say something that sounds like sorry. They'll mutter it. They'll whisper it. They'll growl it at you. But they don't want to say sorry. And actually I think sometimes we can be like that. Sometimes we can say the word but there's no feeling behind it at all. By saying sorry to God it means he's not going to raise it again. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to bring our, our baggage with us and we want, he wants us to, to say sorry. And in that knowledge that we are truly sorry that then we are then forgiven and we are reconciled with God. And then we can receive forgiveness. C.S. Lewis said, if God forgives us, we must forgive ourselves. Otherwise, it's almost like setting up ourselves as a higher tribunal than him. It's like going to be judged at the gates of heaven and going, right, well, you said yes, God, but I'm just going to have a little think about it myself. We need to trust that God forgives. We can forgive others, we can have people forgive us, but we also need to forgive ourselves. When I was preparing this, I read online a story of, of a man called George Wilson. George Wilson lived in America. He killed a government employee who caught him in the act of robbing the mail. He was tried and sentenced to death. However, the president at the time, Andrew Jackson, sent him a pardon. And the pardon would meant no death sentence. But Wilson did a strange thing. He refused to accept the pardon and no one knew what to do. So the case had to go to the Supreme Court where the Chief Justice wrote this opinion. He said, a pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. George Wilson refused to accept his pardon and was killed. But actually, if we don't accept God's pardon, we're going to die too. We're not going to have the opportunity to be in heaven with him. So actually, we need to forgive others. We need to seek forgiveness ourselves, but we also need to forgive ourselves. And if we do that, then the second phrase that Jesus mentions on the cross, the one that we heard right at the end of the reading. Jesus answered him, the second criminal on the cross next to him. Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We see two stories, don't we? We see one where one criminal still won't accept that he's done wrong. And rather than feel that remorse, he chooses to attack Jesus. And the other one who says, don't you know what this going on here do you not know who this is and says before Jesus thought I know I've done it wrong I, I deserve to be here you don't please remember me when you get to heaven and Jesus says truly I tell you today you will be with me in paradise and we'll see as we go through the next five over the coming weeks that they could almost sum up the gospel in their entirety forgiveness the hope and promise of heaven. And more as we see as we go on through the weeks. So I want to encourage you as we continue to pray for the Ukraine and other situations across the world. Sometimes we need to have a better, better understanding of forgiveness. A better understanding of the situations going on. God calls us to forgive because we have been forgiven. And God calls us to accept that forgiveness he gives to us when we ask for it. And that then truly we will be set free. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that even in the horror of the cross, you can teach us so much. Lord, help us in this difficult time in this world to understand forgiveness better. Help us to know as well that as we hold on to um, our own baggage that we need to be forgiven for, help us to to give it to you, help us to lay it at the foot of the cross in the knowledge that you will pardon us. 
But Lord, help us to recognise that pardon is given and needs to be accepted. And then truly we'll be in relationship with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It seems appropriate that our final song this morning is Amazing Grace.